I'm supposed to go live. I will quickly see if I see myself. Um, it's setting up your meeting for YouTube live. So it was the other time I had started talking and then I realized, oh, now I'm here. That's good. Okay, so good afternoon, Europe. Good morning, United States and wherever else you are in the world. My name is Carsten Schradin. I'm the host of Today's Fine. I'm a researcher at the CNRS in Strasbourg, France, working in South Africa. And it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you um, to be here together with us tonight or today, this morning. And um, today we are going to hear a talk by Peter Biedermann about um, ambrosia beetles and other beetles and um, um, uh, microbial, um, microbial management. Um, Peter is originally from Austria. He studied at the University of Graz, but then he did his um, PhD at the University of Bern in Switzerland with Michael Taborski. And I think he already went for his master's degree actually to, to Michael's lab. You might remember Michael Taborski, he gave one of the first files in our first um, series in, in the autumn of 2020, the, the first um, corona, corona year. So Peter did his PhD on the um, evolution of cooperation in ambrosia beetles. I'm sure we're going to hear something about this today. One of the few species that are not humanopteran insects that are um, said to be um, eusocial. And after his PhD in Bern, he went to the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology in Jena, where he was, was working from 2012 till 2017, after which he um, got a grant from the German Science Foundation for a so-called Eminöter program. The Eminöter program is uh, very prestigious. It is to give young scientists that don't have a permanent position yet the funding for, I believe it's five years to have a small research group with PhD students and everything to um, become a leader in the field. It's very competitive. For example, I applied for it when I was young and I didn't get it. I still I managed to make, make a career, but it's much easier if you get um, this support. And obviously, um, he was um, successful with this. The Eminöte, by the way, he did at the University of Würzburg in Southern Germany, which is one of the hotspots of insect sociobiology. Um, like Höldo, I think Höldobler is rich, was from Würzburg, isn't he? Höldobler is somebody which everybody here, of course, um, will, will know. And then in 2020, he became a professorship, got a permanent position at the University of Freiburg here in the southwest of Germany actually only one hour by car away from where I'm living. I, I work in Strasbourg in France, but I live in Germany. It's still, it's 12 kilometers by bicycle from my home to the university. So it's um, all, all very close. And there he is uh, actually not at the biology department, but at the department for forest entomology. He's a professor for forest entom entom entomology. And he is at the uh, department for forest management and so on. Also showing how important behavioral ecology can be for other fields, also for more applied fields and for students to train in this. Peter um, published more around 50 papers and in, in all kinds of journals, including TREE and PNAS. He has been very successful and he is a very determined scientist. He's very um, happy to talk about um, his work. And this you can see by the fact that he's actually today on holidays. He went back to Austria into the mountains to enjoy his time there. But he says science is so much fun. He's still willing to give the fine to all of us. But remember what happened when Hannah Koko did the same. And then the internet connection broke down and it was a bit of a disaster. And this is why um, Peter recorded his talk and I have it and we, I will um, then screen his recorded talk to be sure there will be no problem with the internet connection. But you see, he is here with us. He will be there um, for, for the um, discussion to answer all, all your questions. And also Peter, he provided some um, nice teaching slides, which I still have to put up. Um, you see them here. And these will become available on the fine homepage. And for any one of you who wants to use some of these beautiful slides in his or her teaching, you then welcome um, to download them from the fine homepage and, and to use them. So, but um, Peter is with us. And before I start um, to show his recorded talk, I would still ask him to quickly say hello to everyone here. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Carsten, to this very nice introduction. And thank you very much also, Eduardo and Carsten, for organizing this fine seminar series. And I'm really happy to uh, to spend some time of my vacation with you. Yes, I'm in Austria in the, in the mountains and I'm not going skiing today, but I'm with you. Um, yeah, and... Uh, because I wasn't sure of the internet connection, I recorded the talk. Recorded talks, you know, uh, it's all not, not like giving it live. So I apologize if it's not the same quality than, than I would do interactively. But um, I hope you will like it. And uh, I'm there for your questions afterwards. So enjoy. Okay, great. So I will um, start this now. and. If there's any problem, um, because I didn't do it like this before, then maybe somebody of you could could let me let me know. Like for example, now I don't see myself. Why do I not see myself? I should at least be able to mute myself. Hey, why do I not see myself? Ah, I can mute myself, but I don't see anybody. Okay, I started now, and um, if there's a problem, please, please say something or write it in the chat. Welcome everybody. Thank it's you okay. very much uh, for the invitation to, to give uh, one of these fine seminars. It's a great pleasure and a great honor for me actually to, to do that. Today I want to talk about evolutionary feedbacks between insect sociality and microbial management, will be, which will be may, uh, mainly focused on beetle social evolution. In, and in particular, Bach and Ambrosia beetle social evolution, which, which are my main model systems. So from a basic research perspective, me and my lab are mostly interested in the evolution of cooperation in general, especially in insects. And what we mean with that is the interspecific evolution of interspecific mutualisms. For example, like in fungus farming insects, um, between insect and fungus, um, and in intraspecific uh, social behavior. And uh, very uh, nice model systems for studying cooperation on both of these levels are actually fungus farming insects, like the leafcutter ants, the fungus farming termites and the hardly known ambrosia beetles. So all of them are social to some degree and are in obligate mutualism with fungi. And what might be not so clear to everyone is that ants, termites and the ambrosia beetles, they evolve their sociality within wood. Um, and, and this is not untypical. There are many origins of sociality within wood. And why is this so? Um, wood is a very long-lived substrate uh, compared to the life of an insect. If you, if you can imagine a big trunk uh, that will last for several insect generations and can potentially host several generations uh, of an insect and provide food for several generations. And additionally, because the insects are then usually specialized on, on specific types of wood, like uh, a specific level of degradation, uh, specific tree species, and, uh, and these uh, pieces of wood are uh, very unequally distributed within the forest and uh, are really hard to locate. And so there are typically high costs, costs of dispersal involved with um, specializing on wood because it's, it's very unlikely that you will really find uh, another food resource again. Uh, and so both of these uh, factors actually favor sociality to stay with the family um, and to, to use this substrate for longer than just one generation. And at the same time, wood is uh, rich in polymers like uh, lignin and cellulose, which are typically hard to degrade for insects. 
and uh, they need to associate with microorganisms to do so. Additionally, wood has a very low nitrogen contents and uh, a lot of toxic plant meta metabolites, uh, which favors uh, all three favor the evolution of mutualism with microorganisms, either within the body, uh, within the guts, um, or um, outside as ectosymbionts. So my uh, major model systems are wood boring weevils, Curculonidae. Uh, Within the Curculonidae, we have this Colitine, uh, a subfamily, the so called bark beetles, um, which then have also Ambrosia beetles uh, as a poly uh, uh, polyphyletic groups uh, in, within this Colitine. So the ancestral um, habit of these Colitine beetles are, um, or bark beetles is flow and breeding. As you can see here on the left picture, you have a, a central tunnel made by a female, adult female, and then the larval tunnels spreading out um, singly. So in this case, you have uh, subsocialty. So you have um, a, a mother that is caring for the eggs uh, and protecting uh, the, the tunnel system. Um, and then from this ancestral system of flow and breeding, um, the ambrosia beetle uh, habit uh, evolved quite frequently. So um, these beetles then don't bore in the phloem anymore, but bore in the xylem, which is much poorer in nutrients. And there they are dependent on mutualistic fungi, which grow into the wood and translocate nutrients towards the beetle nests where they feed on the fruiting structures of the fungi only, not on the wood anymore. And um, what has changed uh, regarding uh, the social life uh, in these ambrosia beetles is that they all uh, live in a cooperative nest. So the larvae and adults move freely within the nest and uh, interact with it, which is out with each other uh, quite frequently. Um, and at the same time, um, from, from this flow and breeding to the xylem breeding habit, you have a transition from symbiosis with plant pathogenic fungi that help the beetles to colonize and kill trees in the bark beetles. Um, and as ambrosia beetles only go into dead trees, uh, these, these fungi then evolve to be nutritional mutualists. And what is really fascinating is that this uh, ambrosia beetle habit um, evolved multiple times within the bark beetles. So here you have a phyl phylogenetic tree of bark beetles in black, and you have uh, at least 11 independent origins of this ambrosia feeding. So feeding uh, obligate mutualism with fungi in blue here. Um, so this, this obligate fungi culture evolved 11 times independently and usually co-evolved also with uh, sociality, although we know very little about that because actually we know only from a new social beetle in this group down here. Um, I've studied several species over here uh, with faculty view sociality um, and and then all the others um, are still not known uh, how they behave, but uh, I expect that many of them are probably social. Uh, why are ambrosia beetles so little known um, and why are, is there so little known about their social behavior? The reason is that they are hardly observable. So. Uh, you see here different uh, ambrosia beetle tunnel systems within the wood. And if you split up the wood, then, then you get a picture like this. For example, this is a cooperatively breeding ambrosia beetle. You have uh, one adult female, several um, adult daughters of this female. Um, 
and then lots of larvae and on the tunnel walls you have this yellow fungus layer the beetles are feeding on so you split up the nest you see that and then but you cannot observe any um, any behaviors uh, but you just destroy the nest you can collect individuals you can collect the fungus yes that's all possible but it's not possible to study behavior uh, and uh, exper experimentally manipulate the behavior so um, I started w in 2007 um, I started my master studies at the University of Bern with, with a picture like that. Uh, so uh, I originally I want I always wanted to work with birds. I was always interested in social behavior. And then my uh, my professor Michael Taborski uh, told me, yeah, so I've just read about these ambrosia beetles that that are fungus farming, that are social and that are actually quite common in Europe isn't it fascinating and i was like what beetles that are fungus farming that are social wow that sounds really cool and then he said yeah the problem is that there is no lab rearing technique and there's we can hardly study them and but you may may be able to make your career uh, if you are able to 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 design a, a lab rearing technique and so um so i and this was actually my master's thesis. Uh, I decided to do so. I decided to try it and use different uh, rearing techniques for wood living insects uh, and was finally successful to do so. And you see here now we rear these ambrosia beetles. We can rear a couple of species now in this uh, sawdust agar mixture. mixture. Uh, in glass tubes or plastic tubes um, and with these within these tubes we can observe the behavior and we can actually also manip manipulate uh, galleries yeah that was a big breakthrough um, and really in the end really uh, made my career yeah you can say um, so how does a typical life cycle of an ambrosia beetle look like so it all starts with a dispersal flight of a female. This female uh, transmits um, spores of its mutualistic fungus in, in a so-called mycotangium, a spore-carrying organ. So these spores are ver vertically transmitted. Uh, and as soon as a female found a suitable host tree, it digs a tunnel, inseminates the tunnel walls with, with the fungus. Then the fungus grows. Uh, if the fungus is making fruiting structures, then the, the beetle feeds on it and can start then to lay eggs, produce a brood, which is rarely successful. One has, so we, we, what we see is that only 10 to 20 percent of all females in the lab, but also in the field, are successful uh, to found, found their nest. Most, what happens most often is that other fungi um, uh, fungal weeds uh, predominate at the beginning and then the, the female dies. Okay, the female produces a brood. In many ambrosia, many ambrosia beetles are inbreeding and haplodiploid, so the, the females can decide upon the, uh, upon the sex ratio and usually you have only one or two males uh, that all fertilize uh, all their sisters. And uh, then the sisters start to disperse, but some of the sisters stay with the mother, as you can see here in this graph a uh, uh, picture I already showed you. So I actually started my, after, after developing this viewing technique, I really started with a picture like that. So what, what is happening there? So here you can see this is um, the average of six nests, the number of individuals, uh, larvae, major, mature females, dispersing females, and the days after gallery foundation now with lab cultures. What you see is at the beginning, we put one female in, it's already fertilized by brother, uh, brings its fungus already. So uh, after a while, uh, 
after five, six days produces eggs and after around 20 days the first larvae appear and then these larvae accumulate within the nest. Around day 40 the first adults develop um, and they also accumulate within the nest as you can see here. So they don't disperse immediately but they also accumulate within the nest. And then you have this delayed dispersing period. You have um, a, a period of around 20 days that uh, where the adults need before they disperse, but some of the adults also stay much longer. So when we were marking individuals over here, we realized that some of the individuals dispersed quite early, while others uh, stayed for a really long time with the mother until actually the the, the substrate deteriorated uh, and all individuals left the nest. What was also interesting to see is that around day 80 the foundress usually dies and what you can see afterwards is another peak of larvae suggesting that one of the daughters uh, was overtaking the role of the, of the queen so to say. And what we have found now is that it's in some cases it's also multiple females that start to lay eggs. So if the nest is really productive, then multiple females lay e uh, eggs at the same time, and there seem to be little conflict over that. So, um, but whenever you have uh, delayed dispersal, you also need to talk about the costs of delayed dispersal um, because usually. In most solitary animals, offspring leaves the nest site to emit inbreeding and competition with relatives. So uh, if you have a social system where you have a delayed dispersal, this needs an explanation. So um, how is the competition for food relaxed? And there are two main strategies. Uh, Oh yeah, two main, uh, so social animals can be classified in two major groups, how they overcome this competition for food. The first ones are the central nest foragers, very typical for birds, for, for lots of social insects like ants, bees, uh, but also social mammals. There's a central nest site and the individuals uh, go out for foraging. Um, and then return uh, to a safe haven. Uh, haven. And so uh, there is no competition for food between these relatives or very little competition for food. On the other hand, much less known but uh, very widespread in insects uh, is the fortra, fortress defender social system. So uh, that means uh, the insects are nesting in a really rich food resource. So there's no competition for food because it's a so rich resource, but this resource source um, has to be defended. And uh, typical examples are galling aphids. So they make quite some investment to make these goals and then they need to protect these goals against conspecifics. And uh, then uh, dry wood termites are another example, or ambrosia beetles. They also have a very rich, uh, live in a very rich resource because of the fungus, and there's probably very little competition for food. Um, and in, when these uh, systems evolve towards eusociality, uh, the first ones are uh, characterized by sterile foragers and the later are characterized by sterile soldiers. But what about ambrosia beetles? Uh, so it's, it, it's known already since the 90s, but described quite well in this article from 2018. That, we, that there is an obligately used social ambrosia beetle in Australia, but uh, there we neither see um, for, uh, foraging nor we see defense of the nest. 
So um, how, what were the, uh, how, how does that scheme work towards sterile cast evolution? Actually, it doesn't work. So there need to be another explanation why some of the individuals became uh, sterile helpers. So let us have a closer look in the, in the behaviors of ambrosia beetles. So here you see adult female, you can see larvae. Take a close look what, what behaviors you can recognize. So you see some cleaning here. Here, here you see some grooming. They groom the, the larvae groom the glass. Here you see also some grooming. There's some feeding. Another one cleaning the wall. Another two cleaning the wall. Here an adult grooming a larvae. So what you need to know um, about uh, this habitat, it's, it's a, a very humid habitat with a lot of microbial growth. And so uh, the, one of the major tasks for the ambrosia beetles uh, in this substrate is microbial management. Um, so one of the most common behaviors are allo grooming, nest hygiene. So throwing out f f spores, throwing out um, wheat, spores of wheat fungi, throwing out feces, throwing out sawdust, um, throwing out diseased individuals, uh, fungus tending, all microbial management uh, tasks. And very interestingly, there's also division of labor between larvae and adults. I cannot go into the details uh, in this talk, but uh, the larvae do different tasks than the adults. Um, and so the larvae are balling feces and sawdust to small balls and these balls are then thrown out by the adults from the nest. And among adults, there are also, there's also division of labor that uh, individuals that uh, lay eggs, they actually engage more into brood care than uh, non-egg layers. So um, let me come first to the defense against fungal pathogens. So we we saw when I when I when I first saw these larval behaviors, this was really striking because if you think on other social insects, usually the the larvae are fe um, are fed by the adults and uh, are, are not helping at all. But here, uh, what we saw is that the larvae were bowling, making these balls uh, out of feces and sawdust. And so I was interested whether the larvae are able to uh, suppress pathogens. So here you see some of the pathogenic fungi, they are often occurring in beetle nests. And so I um, did an experimental treatment where I took uh, an old nest and made two artificial chambers in this old nest. And in one uh, uh, chamber, I put a pupae with six larvae. And in the other one, one pupa with one larvae. And I was interested whether the, the six larvae are better able to control the spread of pathogens. Uh, and that, that, that was what I found. So uh, actually, all the pupae survived with the six larvae, but none of the pupae survived with the one larvae. And the reason is, you can see already here, this is a group with uh, six larvae, two dispersed already. You see uh, the pathogens are completely suppressed, whereas uh, with the one larva, the, it couldn't control the pathogens. Um, in another experiment by one of my master students, um, we then uh, injected uh, pathogens uh, within the nest and wanted to see whether there's uh, uh, whether the beetles also plastically uh, react towards these pathogens. So uh, in this experiment, we used one of the pathogens, Aspergillus flavus, 
and injected either buffer solution or a spore solution uh, within the nests. And uh, we found something really fascinating because these pathogens induced delayed dispersal. Um, so we were actually expecting that when we, we, we lower the quality of the nest by injecting pathogens, then uh, less individuals will stay with the mother. By contrast, we found that they actually, the adult daughters were actually delaying uh, probably to, to help the mother uh, or the relatives to defend their nests. Um, and uh, of course, uh, we, we also looked at the specific behaviors what, uh, what were shown in these nests. And here you see before the injection, the, the, the frequency of grooming in the nest before the injection of pathogens and after the injection of pathogens, you see that uh, it was uh, the amount of grooming, um, um, frequency of grooming was uh, doubled due to the pathogens. And in general, we found also higher activity. So uh, the, the beetles were really alert. And uh, we also found more cannibalism because some of these uh, individuals got uh, infected by the pathogen and were then consumed. And uh, what, was, what we also showed is that the grooming actually reduces uh, the spore load of this pathogen. Um, we are not actually sure yet um, how the, the, the beetles defend against these pathogens, but uh, it's possible that they use defensive bacteria similar to fungus farming ants. Um, uh, because we isolated a bacterium uh, that is specifically inhibiting wheat fungi, but not the cultivar fungus, as you can see here in this graph and also in this graph and also in the figures here in the middle, there was this bacterium inoculated. Over here, there was either the uh, fungus, uh, the food fungus inoculated or a pathogenic fungus. And in the most uh, strongest case, as you see here, we, we found uh, the food fungus growing all over the plate, being not inhibited by the bacterium, whereas the pathogen was so strongly inhibited that it did not even start to grow. And we later found out that the reason is that this uh, bacterium is producing cyclohexamide and neuromycin, and cyclohexamide is actually a general fungicide. And quite interestingly, uh, ambrosia beetle fungi um, are largely insensitive to cyclohexamide, which certainly must have a role in nature. So this could be a, pot a potential defensive symbiont, but uh, we need to prove that in the future. So um, the more beetles there are, the more larvae there are, the better is the defense against uh, pathogens. But how about the fungal mutualists? Um, so what is quite fascinating of, uh, about ambrosia beetles is that they attack um, uh, trees emitting alcohol. So they are really fond of alcohol which is actually quite strange, uh, but I, I never really thought about it. The, uh, so it was never questioned why ambrosia beetles uh, attack, uh, are really attracted to ethanol, uh, to wood it, uh, yeah, emitting ethanol, because actually ethanol is an antibiotic substance and it's quite strange that a, a beetle that is dependent on microorganisms uses um, uh, ethanol uh, as a chiromone, yeah, and and so that was actually one student in the lecture asking me, isn't it really strange why the beetles do that? And then I decided to do an experiment and check whether the amount of ethanol has has a positive or negative influence on the fitness of the beetles. Um, in our artificial media. And what we actually found is, as you can see here, the offspring numbers and the ethanol content of wood is actually that uh, a 2% um, uh, two percent ethanol within the substrate is uh, optimal for beetle reproduction, which of course has must have something to do with fungi. So we, we then tested several different uh, food fungi and several different pathogens were isolated from different ambrosia beetle species. 
And what we generally found is that these food fungi, they are insensitive to uh, ethanol, uh, to low amounts of ethanol, and even profit from low amounts of ethanol because they use it as a carbon source. Whereas all pathogenic fungi, they grow really uh, uh, much worse the higher the concentration of ethanol. So, so the ethanol has actually a dual effect. It, it um, benefits the growth of the food fungi and benefits the competition of the food fungi against the pathogens. Um, but this is uh, independent of the social behavior of the beetles, but let's have a closer look um, now on the behavior, how the beetles actually promote uh, the, the food fungi. What is quite interesting is that um, these food fungi of the ambrosia beetles, they're only on the, on the plates in culture. When we culture them, they only grow as a mycelium. And we didn't find any way to, to induce the fruiting structures, which are lining the tunnel walls uh, when the beetles are present. So, um, and I once did an experiment uh, where I, I made uh, plates with with different ambrosia fungi and then put uh, different treatments uh, under these plastic cups. And one treatment was also to put adults um, and larvae under these plastic cups. And what I found is that the adults were actually strongly inducing uh, these fruiting structures, but no other means could induce uh, the, this, this fruiting than the adult beetles. So this, um, I, this effect I observed uh, around 2011, I think, um, and it took me almost 10 years to find out uh, what's the mechanism behind that. And one, um, and, uh, one of my students, Pamela Baumann, she, she uh, found, found it at the end. So at the end, it's again a bacterium that is associated with the adult beetles and uh, as you can see here here when this bacterium is plated against the fruit fungus um, in the inhibition zone the fruit fungus starts to produce these fruiting structures and here you see that again here you see it on the plates on the media uh, without bacteria the fungus grows only as a mycelium with bacteria it produces these fruiting structures and with, within the beetle nest, without beetles, the fungus produces mycelium. With the beetles, uh, it produces these fruit, the same fruiting structures, the same magnification. So what that means is um, that the, the management of microbes probably drives the ambrosia beetle sociality. So because we have this positive feedback between the social system and the mutualism, the more adult beetles there are, the better the fungus grows, the more larvae and adults there are, the better the protection against pathogens. At the same time then, the, the, the mutualism is strengthened by the more individuals and so it provides more food and, uh, and then uh, the, yeah, so, so the social system benefits again. So there's a positive feedback between this uh, social system and the mutualism. And this uh, positive feedback is only limited by the durability of the, the wood substrate actually. Uh, because what we see is that this uh, eusocial ambrosia beetle, it's a breeding in living trees, which is an unlimited food resource. Uh, it's known that these nests can last more than 30 years, but maybe even longer for this new social ambrosia beetle. And most of the other uh, social but not new social ambrosia beetles, they, they have nests that are durable for maybe one or two years, for, for maybe two to four generations maximum. And, and so this can probably never evolve towards obligate your sociality because of this restriction. But uh, when I then talked about this, um, um, this 
management of microbes as a potential driver for ambrosia beetle uh, uh, sociality. One of my good colleagues, uh, Marco Rolfs in Bremen, um, who is working on a Drosophila um, uh, microbial ecology, he told me that he, he's, he observes actually similar things in his Drosophila larvae. So when they aggregate, when these fruit fly larvae aggregate, they are able to overcome uh, toxic molds. They can, uh, if they feed in groups on these toxic molds, then the, the toxic molds are not quick enough to produce defensive compounds, and so they, the larvae can actually consume um, um, these uh, these toxic molds. And um, and this this he observed in two different uh, fungal species uh, that that always when there were more larvae, that the the survival was much better than when there were less larvae. And um, at the same time, we then, when we discussed this, we, we found a new paper by, by Schukla on burying beetles. And maybe some of you know per burying beetles. These, these are beetles that bury carcasses of usually mice um, under the ground. And uh, they then lay eggs in this, uh, on these carcasses and the parents, male and female, stay with the brood, feed the brood and care for the brood. And when you would remove these parents, then uh, what you can see here under this B graph, then a mucor species get, is getting really abundant, which is uh, quite detrimental. Most of the offspring dies because uh, when when these carcasses are not tended by the uh, by the adults. On the other hand, when the, ten, uh, the adults are there, then a Yarovia yeast is spread all over, and this Yarovia yeast actually helps the the, the beetles and the larvae to degrade uh, the substrate. So, in a way, you can say this uh, with this paper they found that these burying beetles are actually also farming these yeasts and uh, which is also similar to um, uh, Drosophila larvae actually they also kind of farm farm their yeasts in these social groups and so they are farming the yeasts uh, when the parents are there and um, you also find this management of microbes in new social societies, um, in the most extreme case, in the leaf cutter ants, you have uh, really ca specific casts specializing on um, managing managing specific microbes. For example, specific casts are responsible for caring for the fungus garden. The specific casts are uh, responsible for for grooming um, others. Specific casts are, are are throwing out individuals um, and so on. So um, there is, yeah, uh, it, it even uh, drives the polymorphism. So the management of r microbes can even drive the polymorphism uh, in EU social casts. So uh, with that. Um, we wanted to show or showed that um, you have these microbes as, as drivers uh, for insert sociality uh, due to this microbial management on different levels. You can find that on in semi-social aggregation, like in fruit fell larvae, you can find it. Uh, that microbes are a driver for microbial management is a driver for parental care in burying beetles. Microbial management is probably a driver for use of faculty for use sociality in ambrosia beetles, and even in obligately use social systems for uh, caste differentiation. Um, but is there a, a correlation between uh, sociality and micro, microbial mutualisms? This I looked at in my recent um, review um, on insect fungus mutualisms. Maybe some of you have seen it. So there we looked how do fungi 
uh, actually profit uh, from in, when they are in mutualism with insects. And uh, here you can see the different benefits we found. And we found that the most complex mutualisms, the most highly evolved mutualisms are, are only found in social taxa, which are already giving an ind indication that actually this could be um, evolved, to, could have been evolved together. And interestingly, uh, the, the co-evolution uh, of sociality and mutualism is particularly present in beetles. You see um, uh, among the 10 independent insect lineages, five uh, are, are beetles in here. And um, one of my PhD stu students is currently working on a review on uh, beetle sociality. Um, where we, and what is interesting with, with this beetle sociality is that actually this uh, larval uh, social behavior is, is not, not so uncommon in beetles. Um, but uh, what, you, what we can also see is if we look at um, high, higher sociality, uh, so let's say allaparental care, above allaparental care, um, or larval allaparental care. Um, this you ha almost only find in beetles nesting within wood or within plants or mushrooms in, in blue here, in wood beetle groups. Which again points to the uh, fact that I introduced at the beginning that wood is really um, a habitat facilitating sociality, in particular in beetles. So, and what we, what he also showed, what Medi also showed, is that this um, uh, microbial management drives social evolution in many beetle groups. So here you see uh, the the beetle groups he he found out to be where microbial management plays a big role. For maize sociality, there were two two families. Larval sociality, also two families, including here the ambrosia beetles. And for female sociality, microbial management is really, really uh, often a driver. So, in addition to the major drivers of social evolution that have been pointed out by Korb and Heinze for insects. Um, like the acquisition of food and animal defense, we think there is a very important micro, uh, third driver, uh, the microbial management, which is particularly important in beetles. And this um, selects for cleaners and farmers. And why there's uh, these cleaners and farmers only rarely evolved into castes, there's probably only this one case of this one new social ambrosia beetle is because maybe these behaviors uh, don't strongly trade off with reproduction in comparison to foraging or, or soldier behavior. So the co messages, cooperative management of microbes is ubiquitous in arthropods uh, and it plays a major role in beetle social evolution, but its possible role in promoting social evolution is rarely acknowledged. Open questions, what are the main mechanisms uh, of insects to select beneficial microbes? So they always need to, the, the important thing is that they need to select the beneficial ones, uh, but not, uh, and to defend against the pathogenic ones at the same time. And how do they do that? And is cooperative microbial management only important in insects or also in other animal groups? And if not, why is it the case that it's not important? With that, uh, I want to acknowledge my group in Freiburg, then some of my mentors, Michael Daborski, Kirk Leipzig, Martin Kartenburg, Jörg Müller, my funding, and uh, collaborators in, in this uh, research I presented today, like Deja Nordkla, Medi Kadrui, and Marco Rose. And thank you for your attention.
Yes, thank you very much. It's a fascinating topic, this um, amazing what, what's happening there and also like what, what you pointed out at the beginning of your talk, how important it is to develop methods to be able to, to study these systems, which on first glance, you think they're hitting, hidden in these, in these tree trunks and you can never observe the behavior. Also showing how, how much these kind of innovations and trying things other than work are important for, for our field to, to finally succeed. Um, like always, when you have questions, I mean, most people already do know it, please, um, um write a question mark in the chat i will then call you up and then um, please first introduce um, yourself what's your name and um where, where you're coming from even though we know each other in the meantime pretty well there are still always new people also coming to the fine like i see today with insect biology there are people that don't come come that often and um um yeah, I will start still even there's no question mark with um, michael Dabowski raised his hand if and he can can start the discussion with his his question. Um, you you muted, Michael. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Michael Taborski, University of Bern. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. I found it extremely interesting to see the new development and. Uh, new information that you obtained uh, from this uh, beetle fungus mutualism and, and the interaction with microbes. What I, I just have a, a, a sort of general comment. I, I fully agree with you that um, what you are investigating and showing is somewhat different from uh, the two um, major strategies that have been uh, discussed up to now regarding the uh, basic requirements for the evolution of the highest levels of sociality. But I, I, would, I would frame it a little bit more generally even. I think it's, it's uh, I think the microbial management is part of the enhancement of the quality of the environment. Mm -hmm. it's, it's probably not the only thing, but I mean, what, what you can do when you when you try to avoid uh, competition uh, among social partners that would uh, prevent sociality to evolve mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is to uh, either defend it against others, yeah? Mm -hmm. Or you can increase it. You can just, mm -hmm. by synergism, you can produce more. So, so it is, in, in effect, it is resource production, what, what these animals do. That can be by microbial management. That can be also by uh, just, um, yeah, uh, agriculture in the broadest sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think I think um, it is a, a, a much more general category that you are showing and demonstrating with with mm -hmm. this microbial management. That's that's my point. It's yeah. it's <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael. That's a really good point. I never really thought about it, but you're totally right. Yeah, of course, they are enhancing the longevity of, of the habitat and, and by this also uh, reducing competition uh, among each other for the, for the resources. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, then we have the next questions by Max Aubrey. Hi, so thank you for the nice uh, talk. So I'm uh, Max Aubrey from IC Austria or ISTA as we are now called, working on uh, ants uh, disease defense. As, and uh, I was wondering uh, about uh, so something you said in the beginning of the talk about how the ambrosia beetles are both uh, haplodiploid and uh, uh, often inbreeding or more or less systematically inbreeding. And I was wondering if uh, you knew about mechanisms that would uh, allow them to not have uh, problems with sex determination uh, because of the inbreeding, like there exist in some ants. I think they are called tramp ants or cardiocondyla ants. The, they have the specific mechanisms on the molecular level, on the, on the chromosomic level to not mm -hmm. have problems uh, producing uh, females when there's a lot of inbreeding. Mm -hmm. so, do you know if there's such a thing in ambrosia beetles and is it tied to their uh, evolution uh, and social evolution? 
Uh, no, no, actually, we don't know anything yet about the sex determination system in these beetles. Um, and so, yeah, no, I, I, I can't answer your question, unfortunately. <laughs> Well, I, I, um, I mean, as the haplotiploid, yeah. the sex mm. determination, I think, is quite clear. I mean, either they, they fertilize the eggs or not. Yeah. And if it's fertilized, it's females. And if not, it's males. So yeah. it's really in the hands of females, actually. And I mean, the, the experimental data of uh, Katharina Pea have shown that they adjust the sex ratio according to the um to the competition among males in the environment mm -hmm. so so they are they are definitely mm -hmm. able to adjust the sex ratio to the um uh, to to maximize or optimize their reproductive success by producing males if males are in need in the environment so mm -hmm. i think i think the sex uh, determination in haploidy breed animals is quite quite straightforward isn't it yeah, and, and what is quite interesting is also that uh, this inbreeding evolved in some lineages of the Ambrosia beetles, and it's always evolved together with haplodiploidy, probably because haplodiploidy then helps to, uh, to cope with inbreeding depression, because the, the genome is ex fully exposed in the males, and so you can get, get rid of deleterial mutations. Um, yeah, that is also an interesting fact you can see a couple of times or at least two or three times in the uh, in the phylogeny of um, bark and ambrosia beetles. Yeah, Thank and you. if, if mm. I may, if I may just briefly add uh, mm. even more. So uh, in, in this haplodiploid ambrosia beetles, at least in the one species that has been studied again mm. by Katharina Pear about that, uh, there was even shown that there is an outbreeding depression. Mm. So that inbreeding improves or increases uh, uh, fecundity because of uh, of a detrimental effect of outbreeding on on uh, the hatching rate of larvae. So so I think I mean this connection between haplodiploidy and inbreeding I think is is really uh, quite interesting in in these beetles. And we have a question by Eduardo. Thank you. I'm Eduardo Ferranz Duque, one of the co-hosts of PINE uh, here at Yale University in the United States. Thank you, Peter, for a wonderful talk. And, and we, we had a wonderful conversation earlier today as well. My question is a little bit more about the natural history of the species, and it comes from my love for trees. <laughs> and so it really, I mean, it's it, because of some very personal stories of how some of very, very old oak trees over 100 years old that we have in our house in Argentina have been victim, have fallen victim to, to some of the bark beetles. What are the, what are the mechanisms by which the females choose the trees? in which they're gonna go in. I mean, I imagine there has to be something about the weaknesses of the trees. I mean, mm -hmm. are there things in the trees that are very predictable that mm -hmm. they're gonna get beetles? And what is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's for, for example, it's ethanol, but there are also some other substances that are um, signaling stress. Uh, and, and actually uh, what, what not many people know, actually even foresters don't really know, uh, is that there are about 3,000 bark beetles worldwide, uh, which are, if you hear the, if a forester hears the term bark beetle, it thinks of, oh no, forest pest, and, but there are only 10 species uh, among these 3,000 that can actually kill living trees. Um, and, and they only rarely do that. Also, most of the species that kill living trees uh, are specialized on recently dead trees and only kill living trees, either if these trees are very stressed or if they occur in very high populations. And so they have no other opportunity uh, than to attack a tree. Uh, um, but usually these populations are not, then not very stable. And what we see now in Europe um, with this uh, spruce, European spruce bark beetle, or, or what you can also see in the US with the pine bark beetles, as, especially in the Western US. So they, are, they have now made, go, go through major outbreaks. But the reason is uh, that the trees are, are very stressed because of climate change. Um, and, and so it's, 
the beetles are reacting to weak trees and they are not uh, born to be tree killers, not natural tree killers. Um, and uh, so in this, I, I, also in your case, it's pretty clear that, or pretty likely that these uh, trees were probably unhealthy, maybe because of drought or so. That's the most common reason. And, and then they were attacked by the beetles because they could smell that the trees were, were highly stressed. Okay, then the next question comes by um, Yael, please. Uh, yes, hi, thank you very much, Peter, for, for such a fascinating uh, story. Um, I want to address something that uh, Michael Taborski and also Max uh, raised, um, and, and that is uh, this question of uh, uh, the benefits of inbreeding, which we've also shown in Cocotrypis and the, uh, in the date stone beetle, and, and hopefully this is going to be published soon. Um, so um, you showed in, in one of the first uh, figures that um, some of the females that uh, that are maturing right at the beginning are dispersing. Uh, they're not staying, and only some females are, are staying to benefit from from the group. And uh, I was wondering if you have anything to say about that, because um, you know why should they disperse? And and. I'll give you some suggestions afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Th th thank you, Yael. It was it's really nice to meet you again since a long time. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, actually, we I I don't know yet what what could could be a reason. I mean, one of the reasons could also be that maybe the more um, more fit females, some of the more fit females at the beginning that uh, want to try it uh, on their own uh, to 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 uh, yeah to found an independent nest. Um, but I'm also curious about your reason. So uh, I th there's so many things we can still experimentally manipulate and and could look at uh, for all these details. Okay, when when exactly does a female disperse and why? And also for the larvae, or when do some of the larvae help? And uh, yeah, th still lots of things to, to do for us, but I'm curious what, what your suggestion would be. Yeah, so, so this is uh, of course work with, uh, with Ali Harari, who's also mm -hmm. uh, here, <laughs> although she's not showing her picture. Um, so, you you also you know you mentioned that there's very high mortality, <laughs> hi Ali, uh, very high mortality um, and very low establishment rate, something like twenty percent even in mm -hmm. the field. Um, so this is this is really really curious why a female will go out of the nest mm -hmm. while there's still plenty of food because this is fairly early on. Um, and, and what I would suggest is that there is some benefit to outbreeding at a certain level. And at least with the, uh, with the date stone beetles, which are, are, you know, social to the, more or less to the extent, well, we don't really <laughs> know a lot yet, um, but more or less to the extent of the, of the species that you've been studying, um, they're, there is evidence from, from, uh, from population genetics that they do outbreed uh, to some extent and, and to a variable extent. So, so even though you did see outbreeding um, depression in the work by, by Katrina Peer, um, maybe outbreeding depression only occurs um, at some level of outbreeding, at a high level of outbreeding, but not at a low level of outbreeding. So I think, I think one really needs to look at the phenology of dispersal and when food is available uh, in, and when there is a high probability of finding uh, a good food patch along with 
outbreeding. This is this is you know this is a lot of complicated ecological mm-hmm. work, mm-hmm. but uh, but I I think there's uh, um, you know it's not it's not simple that inbreeding mm-hmm. is good, outbreeding is bad. Then you have to really ask about this uh, this issue of dispersal. Sorry, yeah. I'm going on and on. <laughs> no, no, th- thank you. These are really good points. I mean this. Uh, this habitat, uh, that the habitat is the quality is is different over the season. This is something I'm really wondering about. So how does this influence also the likelihood of staying? Because certainly there's a, there's a period in the year uh, in the in the spring where it's optimal to disperse because you will find uh, freshly dead wood cut uh, in the winter or thrown over in the winter. Uh, Whereas there's, it's not so optimal throughout the rest of the year then. Uh, and that's actually what we see. We always, in bark and ambrosia beetles, we always see a peak of dispersal in spring and then only very few dispersing in, in summer. And, and this is mm-hmm. really complicating the picture, I would say. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, uh, what you mean about outbreeding, um, that, that they could look for outbreeding options the thing is that these females already are uh, are mated with their brothers uh, also the first ones that disperse uh, so uh, so it's 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 not it's not sure that they really do outbreeding then uh, because they are already mated uh, and it's not clear if if they search for outbreeding options outside uh, although what we also observed is that there are males, so males are flightless in these beetles, but they are coming out of the nest, like in, in the dates, uh, in the date stone beetle, they're coming mm-hmm. out, crawling around on the same uh, trunk, and they could potentially enter um, uh, other nests, uh, but yeah, they are, yeah. I think perhaps. Michael wants to add something too. <laughs> yeah, perhaps, perhaps I can add something because uh, this really uh, draws upon the study of Katharina Pear, the experimental study. Yeah, um, Katharina showed actually that uh, the degree of outbreeding does not really influence the negative effect of outbreeding. What she did was she used either males from the same tree stem or from the same population or from a completely different population. And in all three cases, the outbreeding depression was similar. So only when the, uh, when the females mated with their uh, full brothers, inbred brothers, <laughs> I should say, uh, the, uh, the hatching rate was, was optimal. And in all other outbreeding, in, in the outbreeding conditions, it was about 20 to 30 percent reduced, and there was no difference uh, regarding the degree of outbreeding. So I think, in at least in this particular system, it's just one species. Yeah, one species where we tested that. Uh, the, uh, the the outbreeding opportunities do not really exist, also because, as uh, Peter just explained, they mate always inside their natal gallery. There is no mating outside. But Peter is right that, and this is also something that. Uh, Katharina Peer um, systematically observed that in the field, at least in that species that she investigated, uh, Xilvorenus uh, germanus, uh, the males, uh, after, after they have fertilized all their sisters, they leave, if they still survive, they leave the gallery and then search for other galleries where there may have some chances of uh, fertilizations. And in a genetic study, we were able to show that about 3%, it's a very low percentage, but uh, roughly about 3% in our population uh, of offspring were outbred. So there is some outbreeding, but it is very low and it occurs within the natal gallery of the females. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is um, a little bit different from the um, the date stone beetles where we uh, um, I don't want to give away too much because it's not yet published. Um, but in uh, uh, in a similar experimental setup, um, only uh, outbreeding 
with a different population resulted in, uh, um, in a reduction in fitness uh, of, the, of the offspring. So I, I think there's probably more opportunity for outbreeding in uh, date stone beetles. Ali, do you have anything to add? You're, you're muted. You're muted. Actually, there is an old study that uh, Daphne Gottlieb found that there are, some, there are some beetles, mothers, that lay only female eggs. So the, these females have to, to find some other males, not the brothers. So mm -hmm. outbreeding, at least in the population, exists in the population. Yeah, and, that's, the, that's the same also that... in Ambrosia beetles. We have also have nests without males. Mm. Mm. This is especially for a, a small brood, where there are mm. uh, limited mm. numbers in the brood, they don't have males, they don't have brothers. Exactly, exactly, that's the same here also. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, we, and we also have just male broods, yeah? That's also quite interesting. Yeah. So only one or two percent of nests are just males. Yeah. Uh, and they certainly will also search for uh, opportunities to mate. Yeah. yeah. Okay, then the next question comes from Stan Diewe, which by the way is one of the most gifted students I ever had the privilege to work with, but who unfortunately after doing a master's on striped mice switched to more interesting animals, which are beetles and, and microbes. <laughs> Hi, uh, hi! Thank you so much, uh, Peter. That was a, a great talk. Um, I'm Sandiwe. I am at the MPI for Chemical Ecology here in Jena, mm. and um, I found it really fascinating that there are so many players in this interaction that keep the feedback going. But I'm more interested um, in the microbes. So the Streptomyces and the Pseudomonas that are so important for not only just a defensive role, but for allowing the fruiting of the fungus itself. Are these gut microbes? Um, and if so, how are they, what's the mechanism by which they are released into the environment so that they can fulfill these roles that they are fulfilling in the nest? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good questions. <laughs> and we, we only have uh, partly some answers. So uh, these, um, these Pseudomonas bacteria, they are most likely uh, within the guts. So the, I only uh, isolated them from the guts, but if you, if um, I firstly found them when I let the beetles crawl on a plate uh, and then, uh, so after the dispersal flight, I put them on a plate and then they were inseminating the plate with the ambrosia fungus. And then I found also fruiting structures uh, on the plate and I isolated the bacteria next to it. And, and that's how I found out about this bacteria. And I'm not 100% sure that they are in the guts, but very likely. Um, um, we have not developed fish markers yet, but that's the next step we want to do. We want to check where, where these bacteria are, because they could also be in the mycotangia, um, uh, which would be a, a yeah, logical location, I would say. Um, regarding the Streptomyces bacteria, there we are not even sure if they exist in, in all populations. So this, uh, did I, I worked with an American population of my model species, and there I isolated the Streptomyces bacteria. Uh, in the European uh, species, I could not isolate them. But the, the strange thing is that you have this insensitivity uh, of the fruit uh, of the food fungi to cyclohexamide, um, which should uh, play should play a role uh, in nature if, or either get lost. Uh, so um, there are probably other bacteria that could fulfill this role. You you probably know in bacteria they can uh, exchange genes so you cannot really say okay it's it's this specific bacteria very often this this the same role can be uh, also taken up by another bacteria group so yeah um, we 
there's much more to be done on the bacterial symbionts of these beetles. Um, and I, I, just a question, are you now with Martin Kaltenpott in, in Jena? Yeah, uh, I'm with Martin, yes. Uh, great. And what beetles are, are you working on? So I'm working on grain pest beetles. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Tyrosine provisioning symbionts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, send nice greetings to, to the group. I, I know them all very well. <laughs> we'll do. Thank you so much for the, the answer to the question. You're welcome. And the next question comes by Maren. Hi, my name is Maren Hook from the University of Derby. I have a very basic uh, um, context question. So forgive my ignorance as a fluffy mammal person. Um, the, the haplodiploidy is that uh, normally beetles are not haplodiploid. Is that just certain certain odd species? Is is that sort of correlated with their how social they are, or is it only this one you social one, or is it just an odd pattern? Yeah, may, uh, maybe the question comes from this old theory uh, from the exactly. 70s, Hamilton's theory that haplodiploidy plays a role in social evolution. Um, so in, in these ambrosia beetles, uh, we don't have indications for that. Uh, so uh, normally bark, bark beetles and ambrosia beetles are diploid, uh, but there are, uh, I think, two or three lineages that are haplodiploid and all of them are inbreeders um, and some of them are, uh, are seed feeders like the date stone beetles some of them are ambrosia beetles and i think it plays at least phylogenetically it doesn't play a role uh, in, in uh, for for social evolution but, and this this one you social species just just sort of interest i mean uh, the one this, eusocial species is that haplodiploid? It's deep, no, it's diploid. That is diploid. It's diploid. So, so there are species that are social that are diploid and and haplodiploid. So you have both. Thanks. But but what what you have is because of this inbreeding and haplodiploidy, you have this uh, massive speciation in some of the of these uh, inbreeding and haplodiploid groups, and so these these groups are more common and because some of these groups are, are, are so also social so you would probably find more social species uh, that are haplodiploid but I think it's not because of the haplodiploidy but because of the inbreeding yeah, and the speciation. Uh, so the next question comes by Tringyu. Yeah, hello. Uh, thanks, Peter, for the interesting talk. I'm a junior uh, PhD student uh, of Carson and uh, working at the uh, Cinerest in Strasbourg, France. Uh, so my question is, does this fungi culture beetles have specialized diet to this fungi seed growth, like, like some of the fungi culture ants, or do they eat other things? Um, so the, the, the question is whether the, the beetles only feed on the fungi? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah they, they only, they only uh, feed on the fungi. Uh, but um, that's also something really interesting uh, because I think there is a um, specialization uh, of the larvae and the adults uh, so that they don't compete for the same food. What we see is a succession of different fungi in the nests. So two, at least two uh, nutritional fungi and a very recent data I, I didn't publish yet shows that the, the larvae are attracted to one fungus and the adults are attracted to the other fungus. Uh, and so, but the adults disperse both of the fungi and play, uh, um, and inseminate both of the fungi in the nests, but one fungus is growing first, the other one is growing later, and the first, the first growing fungus is more attractive to the larvae. <laughs> it's quite, quite fascinating. So I think they are feeding on different fungi probably within the wood. And what we also see is that the larvae are, are feeding differently. They're feeding on fungus infested wood. Uh, so they really, they, by this 
feeding on the fungus infested wood, they also make the nest bigger, whereas the adults just feed on the fungus uh, fruiting structures. Okay, thank you. So does, do you know if uh, there are other like beetles that also feed on fungus, but not, but, but do not culture them? Like the... um, yes, uh, there, there is an ambrosia beetle, um, uh, Ambrosiodomus, Ambrosiophilus. These are two, two lineages of ambrosia beetles. They feed on wood degrading fungi and, and they, uh, they just, they bore into wood that is already degraded by fungus and, and they just feed on this uh, degrade, wood degraded, uh, yeah, this fu fungus wood mixture. Um, and this, this, is, this evolved within the ambrosia beetles, so within a, a lineage that was farming fungi. So they apparently they are using this, uh, yeah, they're using fungus, but are not uh, really farming it anymore because it, they don't need to farm it. It's just colonized the wood and they just feed on it. Uh, so do you mean like the, for, uh, for the fungi, uh, so for the so for those uh, beetles that eat fungi, yeah, most of them are fungi culture beetles, not like the free ranging. Yeah, they, I, I think that the, they are just feeding on fungus infested wood. And what is really interesting about their social behavior is that they are communal breeders. So they 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 just nest in this uh, substrate with fungus and and they don't uh, um, show any other social higher social behavior okay, thank and you. all of all of the females uh, breed thank you okay then i have two questions from youtube i don't know whether they are students or not but they are from both from colombia the first one is from juan sebastian hillon Hi, my name is Sebastian. I'm from Rosario, Uni Rosario University in Colombia. First of all, such a nice talk. It's super interesting to see how microbial management drives sociality in insects. And my question is, what are the benefits of staying in the nest that have been inoculated with the spore solution? The pathogens benefits either for the mother beetle or for the young beetles. So, I must say, I didn't completely understand the question. What was the so, last part? Yeah. So what are the benefits for staying in the nest that have been inoculated with the spore solution, the pathogens? Oh, I, yeah. if I understand it right, why yeah. don't it just leave when you put the pathogens yeah. in there? Actually, that, that is also something uh, me and Michael probably were wondering. So we, we kind of expected if we lower the quality of the nest by injecting pathogens, that then more individuals would leave. Uh, but actually, we found uh, the reverse. So we, we actually, so Dea Nordkla showed that they actually stay longer, which suggesting that they're really stay, staying because of indirect fitness benefits, or uh, they because they want to help their relatives to re to to finish their development and and reduce spore loads. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, we also saw that with the higher grooming frequencies, so um, we kind of induced uh, the, this behavior by injecting these spores. And, and we also showed that the, the spore numbers were reduced. So, um, so clearly, like, like Michael said in his first comment, uh, because of they can, can enhance the resource uh, for a longer time if they stay. Okay, then another question from um, another person from Colombia. Hi, my name is Angie Caceres from Colombia. I'm a biology student in Rosario University. It was such a great talk and for me a very interesting topic. My question is, the symbiosis the symbiosis evolved with pathogen and mutualistic species of fungi, or just on one of them. So the symbiosis evolved 
so what, as far as I understood, the question is whether the the beetles are just specialized, or the fungi only the mutualistic fungi are specialized on the beetles, or whether there are also specialized pathogens with the beetles. As far as we know, there are only so the the mutualistic fungi are really species specific. There's a coevolution with the mutualistic fungi, but but we don't have found any pathogens yet that are specialized. Uh, so they're always uh, associated with generalistic pathogens. Uh, in leafcutter ants, you have also specialized pathogens uh, parasitizing the, the mutualistic fungi. As far, we have not found that yet, but it's not impossible that there are also specialized pathogens. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I understood the question right away. I understand it or it would now question me is what do you think was more important for the evolution of sociality in these beetles, these uh, materialistic species of fungi or the defense against pathogens or one cannot differentiate between, between that? Um, <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I, I, would think, um, I would think the defense against pathogens is, is the, uh, the more important factor. Um, even when I also think about the other comparative systems with Drosophila larvae and with burying beetles where it's mostly about the defense and not so much about the promotion uh, of, of beneficial fungi. Um, but generally there's very little known about how do uh, insects uh, promote the growth of bene beneficial symbionts. That's even, even for the leaf cutter ants and the fungus farming termites, that's not so well known how they really promote. It's also for leaf cutter ants and fungus farming termites, these, these fungi produce fruiting structures. It's not known yet how these fruiting structures are induced. Uh, so very similar to, to ambrosia beetles. Okay, then we have a question by Brian White. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, I'm Brian White. I'm a PhD student at uh, Berkeley in University of California, Berkeley. Um, uh, I'm a long time listener of the seminar, but this is the first time asking a question. Um, but this isn't really a question, it's more of a statement I wanted to tell you, Peter, because of a question you added at the end of your talk about um, animals other than insects that might do this kind of microbial management in their sociality. Um, I don't know if you've heard of uh, eusocial trematodes, these parasitic flatworms that are argued to be eusocial because they have like a bimodal size distribution, where usually these tiny ones th uh, that are not full of offspring seem to have like a soldier role, but in many species, we can't see a uh, actual like attacking from these so-called soldiers. Um, so there's probably a, potentially some other function for them. And um, specifically this person in New Zealand, Robert Poulin, his last name is P-O-U-L-I-N, uh, has been starting uh, some projects to investigate if the uh, if this kind of secondary morph is actually trying to do microbial management. Um, and I'll also add that I've at least observed in some species that while they don't ever like bite and consume their colony mates, if their colony mate is dead, then they will do it. So maybe it's sort of like also a kind of management of microbes. Uh, otherwise, you know, you'd be surrounded by dead colony mates and things might start growing. Um, something to think about. Wow, that, thank you very much for pointing that out. I've, I've heard of so uh, you social trematodes, but I, and I don't know anything about them, I must say. But uh, that's, that's great. Yeah, thank you very much for pointing it out. I will check this out. Okay, there's no more questions in the chat on YouTube, so I can come up with an unqualified question or, or comment. As again, I'm a monologist, not knowing much about insects. I mean, you very much pointed out at the end of your talk the importance of microbial management, especially for beetle sociality. And I also think during your talk, you said it is, it's very important that they're in a confined space in these um, holes in, in, in the tree. So if many look at burying beetles, I mean, it's like they're in one confined space. I was wondering, 
Do you think, I mean, there have been some studies, I don't know details about it, on, on sociality, subsociality, however you call it, in, in cockroaches that have a not so dissimilar ecology and feeding on, on stuff like this. But from what I know, typically are not in such a confined space where they are within a small group. Would you expect that in the future, when somebody looks at them in detail, we would find something similar of the importance of microbial management in cockroach societies? Or you think because of these differences in how confined the groups are, it might be different? Um, I think this this confinement is quite important, what you say. I, I think this that you, you have... Um, a location where uh, that that you can clean together uh, or do, do you have a nest that is not too big so that that the microorganism can be really controlled because if it's if you're spreading out too much then you cannot you cannot control it anymore uh, for the cockroaches um I don't know so much about the details. I know more about lower termites and there uh, this micro management doesn't play such a big role because they are nesting in, in uh, dry wood uh, typically. And so there's the microorganisms uh, are not so important there, but what, what is impo very important there is the trophallaxis. So they, they share the microorganisms uh, within the group. Um, and there has been the hypothesis this, this this was driving group living and sociality in these beetles uh, in this uh, in the, the lower termites uh, because they had to exchange the symbionts that are internal in this case um, in and that's the difference in if you have ectosymbionts within wood uh, then you can only have them if the wood is is uh, humid enough if it's too dry, then you have to have them internally. So uh, you see lots of other beetles, uh, like uh, serambicid beetles, the ones with the long, um, um, long antennae. The, they they are not social, uh, and they they don't have external symbionts. They have them inside because they are also going in very dry wood, or usually drier wood than than the the bark beetles. So uh, uh, yeah, I, I would I would think you need a confined space uh, that you where you can control the microorganisms so that it can play a role. Okay, thank you. Yeah, for me this is one of the really new things in um, the FL ecology coming up since I was a student that nobody looked at before the importance of microbes in mm -hmm. so many different ways. And Maren wrote in the chat that she thinks she read that pair living social cockroaches are also very much confined mm -hmm. to one place within a dead tree. So mm -hmm. maybe there will be something more interesting coming up in, in, in the coming years and decades. And for me, it's also always interesting mm -hmm. and important to show here that there's still so much out there for the new, the young generation of um, scientists or of biologists, of zoologists to study. And we're not just uh, um, standing on one point. We're not at the end. There's still so much to, to mm -hmm. find. Then, yeah, and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but, but yes. uh, it just came to my mind. Earwigs are another example of where, where this uh, social, uh, this management of microbes plays a role. Like, um, uh, now I don't remember his name, but there are a few new papers on, on earwigs, uh, root care and so. Matthias um, Kölliker. And... Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, is, is Matthias still in, in where, where is he now? Is he still active? No, well, so uh, as far as I know, he's, he's not active anymore. Uh, no. Because you said there are some new papers, I think I saw something. Yeah, no, yeah, so, uh, uh, another group in, yeah. in Konstanz or something. Uh, uh, Joel Monnier uh, is now, uh, I, uh, the, the, his name comes to my mind, is a student of Matthias Kölliker and he continues now. He's a professor in France, actually, also. Uh, and studies um, earwig sociality. Good, then we have uh, more questions coming up by the first one now by Clara, please. Hi, um, very nice talk. Clara Jones, Clara B. Jones. I have a really primitive question related to this differentiation you find in dispersal 
between females um, who disperse and those who don't, couldn't there simply be a threshold effect whereby some females experience a lower level of competition, some females experience a higher level of competition, and those would be the females that would disperse. If this were possible, then it could very well be a general effect, even across mammals, which I am primarily interested in. Yeah, I think there could be such, such a threshold. It's quite likely that there is uh, variability in the response threshold uh, with, between individuals in a nest. And uh, people have also talked about bed, bed hatching effects. So it's, it's also better for a nest to not release all the offspring at the same time, but, but also over a longer time period uh, so, because you never be sure, is will there be a storm killing all the offspring? So that w it would also make sense to spread it. Uh, so, um, yeah, that would that would require group selection, though. Um, no, not really, because they they are all relatives within the nest, uh, and uh, so that the that then the offspring has. Uh, different response thresholds. Uh, I would I would think it's not has nothing to do with group selection. Or why would you think this has something with group selection? Well, as I understood you, and I might have misunderstood you, I thought you were saying that some females are responsive to all of the effects of the offspring in the group. Yeah, so we, we, we know very little about uh, what they are responding to. What we know is that, that if, if there are more larvae uh, in the nest, then more females will stay back uh, and not disperse. Um, and now we are, we are at the moment, we are doing some experiments where we remove larvae because it could also be that then uh, they also respond not only to the larvae, but also to the food uh, avail availability or so. Yeah. Um, yeah, but we, we know too little about this to, uh, to really say something about it. Okay, thank you. Then we have another question by Yael. Um, yeah, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. Yael Lubin from uh, Ben Gurion University in Israel. Um, so uh, this is not a question, it's just a, a, a comment. I'm absolutely amazed at the uh, defenses against, um, against the fungi because um, it's very difficult to get rid of, of fungi. And uh, most, most organisms, most insects, um, are unable to, to uh, cope with, with, uh, with fungi. You know, bacterial infections are more or less easily coped with. Um, but uh, uh, for example, in social spiders, fun, fun, fungi are, the, are the, the one thing that will kill off a, a social spider colony. So, uh, it's, I'm just expressing amazement at, at, um, at the level of defense that, that uh, these beetles have against uh, pathogenic fun fungi. Yes, I think that's a very good, um, nice uh, uh, words for this fascinating talk. I would like to thank P Peter once again, especially that he took his time during his um, holidays he's spending in the in the Austrian Alps to still spend this afternoon with us. Thank you very much, Peter. And also thank you very much for everyone for contributing to the discussion. And especially I would like to 
thank the students that had very good, interesting questions and very precise questions and really gave a high quality to our fine seminar um, tonight. And I would like to also tell everyone of you to please come back next week when we again talk about youth sociality or not youth sociality, but then in mammals with Markus Zettel, who is going to talk about more red sociality. So with this, 